Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are enjoying the Global HR Forum 2011 so far. Welcome to the special session of afternoon. It is time to getting tired with so many knowledge and information. But now is the time you open your eyes and ears. We have as main speakers in this afternoon session, uh, we have Dr. Francis Fukuyama today. I'm sure this session will not disappoint you. Uh, I am Julian Kim of Hyundai Research Institute, and I'm a great honor to serve as a moderator of, in this session of great scholar and great audience. The topic of our session is Asian politics and Asian individualism. The original topic on the program was different one, the future talent in Asian hegemony. But uh, Professor Fukuyama suggested the new topic, which is more timely and appropriate for this special session. So we changed the topic, uh, and I apologize for causing any inconvenience for you. I hope what we are discussing and sharing today can contribute for the development of Asian politics and also for the development of innovative and creative human resources in Asian society. Now, let me introduce our dis dis distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Francis Fukuyama. He is one of great scholars of our age. Most of us already know him very well through columns and books, but uh, I might not need to introduce him in detail, but for the formality, I will briefly introduce Professor Fukuyama. Uh, Francis Fukuyama is now is working at Stanford University. He used to uh, teaching at uh, Johns Hopkins University for the last 10 years, but recently, from this year, I think, he moved to Stanford University, and he is Olivia Monolini, senior fellow at Stanford University. And he got his PhD in Harvard University. And then he's more known to Koreans is his famous books. The most famous book is, I think, is Trust. It's a very well-known book in Korea. And then the earlier book is more uh, radical, caused more uh, sensations to the world readers. That was the end of history and the last man. That was come in 1992. And then after that, he published the trust. And recently, this year, he published the origins of political order. That become, uh, it is not translated in Korean yet, but it will come soon. So today, in his lecture, he will cover some part of his new book, I think. Now, it's time to invite the Francis Sukuyama to the podium. Let's give a big hand. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Kim, for the kind introduction. I'm really glad uh, to be here at the Global Human Resources Forum. Uh, glad to see all of you this afternoon. Uh, so, as Mr. Kim said, the topic I'm going to address is a little bit different from the one that was printed in the program. Uh, I want to be able to talk about my new book, which is entitled The Origins of Political Order from Pre-Human Times to the French Revolution. Uh, this was published in English uh, last spring, and there is going to be a Korean edition uh, that will probably come out in 2012. Uh, and it's actually the first of two volumes. This only takes us up to the French Revolution, and volume two will cover the 200 years from the French Revolution to the present. Um, but I actually do want to relate the themes of that book, the historical themes of that book, to the topic of the Global Human Resources Forum, which is education. And I want to raise a question which I myself cannot answer, but which I think is critical uh, to the future of the development of talent and education in this region. And the question 
really is, does the fostering of innovation uh, and high-end talent depend in any way on the nature of the political system? Uh, and this is a particular issue in Asia because we have one big dominant country that is an authoritarian country and then a number of other countries, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, that are democracies. And the question that I want to ask or leave with you is whether the form of government, whether it is a free society with an open press, the ability to dissent, uh, criticize the government, whether political freedom is important in creating uh, the kind of freedom that's necessary for technological and economic uh, innovation. Now, these two are not obviously related, but I think that many people in the United States believe that they are. Uh, as Mr. Kim said, I moved to Stanford uh, a little more than a year ago, so I live in Palo Alto, California, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, I think that there is a deep belief that the creativity that you see in the technology industry in that part of the United States is very much the result of a certain kind of culture. Uh, if you look at it historically, it actually grew out of the hippie culture of San Francisco in the 1960s. Uh, this anti-authoritarian um, uh, mentality by a lot of young people who didn't like the rigid rules and the straitjackets of conventional middle-class society. Uh, and many of the innovations that took place there, I think, uh, were the direct product of this very anti-authoritarian attitude. So, for example, you have the open software movement that's produced Linux and a whole variety of different important um, uh, jointly written software uh, uh, products, major software products, all of which are the result of a kind of communal uh, effort in which individual programmers share the results of their work without expecting to get paid, without trying to protect their intellectual property rights because of this notion that uh, creativity depends on reciprocity, on the sharing uh, of ideas. And I think if you look in greater detail at the way that Silicon Valley actually works, there is a tremendous um, willingness to share information and to cooperate that does not exist in other parts of the United States. And that, again, comes from this culture. Uh, Steve Jobs, who just passed away a couple of um, uh, weeks ago, uh, quite tragically, has been in the news in the United States uh, a lot. Uh, he was really a great uh, innovator and in many respects uh, represented the spirit of Silicon Valley with his um, creation of Apple computers and the way that he turned it into a global technology powerhouse. Now, Steve Jobs gave a uh, commencement address at Stanford uh, several years ago that was quoted quite a lot in the American press after he died. And in it, he talked about his unconventional career. He never graduated from college. He started at Reed College. He went for about a year. He didn't like it. And then he quit uh, and then camped out in his roommate's room and continued to go to class as an unofficial uh, student. So he doesn't have any formal educational uh, credentials. He got fired from Apple, the company that he had uh, helped to start. He started several other companies. Some of them failed. Uh, some of them didn't work. Uh, and so, in some sense, his whole life was a struggle against established institutions. Uh, in the speech to the Stanford graduates, he said quite a lot of other things, but at the end of the speech, uh, he quoted from the Whole Earth Catalog, which was a catalog that was made by actually some very environmentally minded people in the 1960s, and he quoted the back page of the catalog that said, stay hungry, stay foolish. Uh, and this was his 
imparting wisdom to all of these young Stanford graduates. Now, I would suspect that in Asia, the hungry part of that resonates pretty well. <laughs> that is to say, he's telling young people that they should stay ambitious, they should want to achieve great things, they should never be satisfied with what they are or what they have at the moment. The foolish part, I think, is a little bit harder to understand or culturally, you know, is probably uh, a bit more di difficult to digest. Uh, and I think what he meant by that uh, in a certain sense is, you know, of course, don't take yourself and other people's expectations too seriously. If you don't have a certain spirit of fun and play, if you're not willing to challenge the conventional orthodoxy, you will never innovate and you will never do anything great. So don't follow the conventional uh, kind of career. And so, um, in a certain sense, Steve Jobs, I think, represents a kind of the epitome of a certain kind of American individualism. You know, he's not the sort of person whose parents told him, you follow this route, you go to this good school, you get a degree, you get a job, make a lot of money, have a family, that's it. He didn't do that. He, he broke all of those rules. In fact, he was adopted, didn't know his biological parents, was raised by a working class family, so a very, very unusual uh, pattern of life, uh, but also highly uh, individualistic. And I think that individualism clearly had a lot to do with the success of his uh, company. And the question is, where does that kind of individualism come from, and to what extent is, the, is individualism the result of the political institutions uh, as well as the surrounding culture uh, of the broader uh, society. And by individualism, I mean a couple of different things. Individualism, in one sense of the word, means who I am is not dependent on who my parents were. That I have the power to make my own life, make my own decisions. Uh, my status is not determined by people around me. All right, And I think this is a general characteristic of modern societies, that increasingly we, we free ourselves from these kinds of social expectations. But there's another sense of individualism that says, you know, I'm an individual with my own opinions, uh, my own views, and I have the right to assert those views against existing authority. And in fact, existing authority has to listen to me in some sense, because uh, I'm the formulator uh, of my own views, I'm the master of my own fate, uh, and so forth, all right? So that's what I mean by individualism. And so the question is, um, how does this develop? How did it develop uh, in the United States, other Western countries, and what are the prospects in Asia? So now I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna go all the way back to uh, some ancient history, uh, which comes out of my new book, The Origins of Political Order, uh, which attempts on a comparative basis to explain the origin of basic political institutions, the state, the rule of law, uh, accountable government, uh, by looking at the way that these institutions developed in different societies. And I start with China, because in my view, uh, China was the first world civilization to develop a modern state. Uh, and this is an achievement uh, that I don't think has been adequately recognized in the West as a really uh, a major achievement. Uh, the state uh, appeared in many different places, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, uh, in Mexico, uh, in other parts of the world but the Chinese were the first to develop a modern state, meaning a state that was not based on friends and family, uh, a patrimonial kind of state where um, basically the state apparatus just grew out of the household of the ruler. The Chinese were the first to invent a modern state in which a centralized government hired a bureaucracy based on merit, 
based on civil service examinations in which people were promoted according to merit and in which the government dealt with its citizens on an impersonal basis. That is to say, you don't get special favors if you're a relative or a cousin or a friend. Uh, the state has laws that it applies uh, to all citizens. And in my view, uh, this kind of a state had already arisen in China uh, at the uh, founding of the Qin Dynasty uh, in 221 BC. Uh, this was the first dynasty in Chinese history that unified uh, the whole of China. Uh, the reasons that this uh, state emerged um, in China at that time really had to do with the extreme um, pressures that were created by a 500-year period of almost continuous warfare uh, among small Chinese states during the uh, spring and autumn and warring states period of ancient Chinese history. Uh, it is this kind of national security competition in which a state would be wiped off the map if it didn't develop uh, strong political institutions. It was that kind of competition that created the pressures for the Chinese, for the state of Qin, to create a bureaucracy, to collect taxes, to invent a modern infantry army instead of aristocrats riding chariots, uh, to register land, and basically to create the system that we associate with China itself. Chinese civilization uh, was created. Now, this happened a long time ago, more than 2,000 years ago. The Chinese, I believe, you know, the single continuous tradition in Chinese culture is to be able to do strong central government well. And I believe that this is still their big advantage. Uh, they have a centralized communist uh, government running a huge country that has been able to make decisions, high quality uh, decisions uh, governing their economic transition since 1978 uh, in a way that I think almost no other authoritarian country can uh, manage. And now there have been other authoritarian countries that have achieved similar results, but they're all in the cultural area formed by Chinese civilization. So this country itself, under uh, Park Chung-hee and a series of military dictators, you know, that was South Korea's uh, high growth uh, period. You have Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. You have the Kuomintang uh, regime in Taiwan. In all of these places, you have authoritarian government that is not predatory, that has a developmental outlook, and terrible as they may be in terms of human rights abuses, nonetheless kept their focus, their policy focus on economic uh, development. And this makes East Asia or the, the Chinese influenced parts of East Asia very different from other parts of the world because I don't believe that there is any other part of the world in which you have this long-standing tradition uh, of high-quality centralized government uh, that, uh, and then, you know, to relate this to the, the themes of uh, this conference, uh, that high-quality government is very much dependent on education uh, because what it me meant to be recruited into the Chinese bureaucracy was to receive a Confucian education, and that's why families in traditional China, you know, pooled their money so that the brightest you know, boy in the village could go and take the exam and hopefully enter the imperial bureaucracy. And I think that's a tradition that lives on uh, with Asian families all over uh, this region uh, to the present moment. Now, China developed a modern state. It did not, however, develop either a rule of law or accountable government. The rule of law are rules that bind the ruler to act according to certain uh, generally accepted principles of justice. Accountable government means the government has to do what's in the interest of the citizens and not what's in the interest of the rulers. And China had a modern state without those constraints 
on political power. And so it was authoritarian uh, right from the beginning. <clears throat> and in fact, because it was a modern authoritarian state, it could exercise a much greater dictatorship. It could, you know, exercise tyrannical power in a way that other less developed states uh, simply could not in terms of coercing its own citizens, in terms of doing things like land reform, in terms of big engineering projects, you know, beginning with the Great Wall but continuing to the Three Gorges Dam uh, and uh, so forth. They were not limited by law and they were not limited by any kind of principle of democratic uh, accountability. The reason I think there wasn't law in China was that China never had a transcendental religion, uh, which is oftentimes the source of, of law uh, in Hinduism, in Christianity, in Judaism, uh, in Islam. All of these uh, traditions, these religious traditions, create a set of laws that limits the ability of political authorities to simply act as they want. China never had this kind of religion, and therefore Chinese rulers never felt themselves constrained to act according to uh, a preordained law. Uh, and that regime, well, okay, I, I, I'm going to skip over a little uh, of the history, but uh, we'll, get back to, we'll get back to China. Now, let me talk about the development of uh, political systems in, uh, in Europe, because their development was really quite uh, different. Uh, Europe, as you know, grew out of the ruins of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman Empire was invaded and settled by a number of barbarian uh, Germanic tribes that eventually evolved into the French and the Germans and the British and, uh, and so forth. Their sequence of development was actually very different because politics in Europe remained very disunited and decentralized up until a very late point in their development. And the first institution to develop in Europe was actually the rule of law. It was not the modern state. The rule of law was established by the Catholic Church uh, in the 11th century, so nearly a thousand years ago, uh, or in the common law in England, which evolved at approximately uh, this time. Uh, it was a set of legal rules that was transnational. In many respects, uh, Europeans felt that they were protected, they had rights uh, that protected them against the power of the state. Uh, and this was a situation that applied even to humble peasants in their relationship with their local, uh, with their local lord. The whole institution of feudalism was not based on kin, kinship relations, uh, you know, as in the Chinese family. It was based on a legal contract between a weaker party and a stronger party, both of whom had obligations to one another. So in some sense, European individualism is already recognized in the law a thousand years ago. An individual could sue a superior, could sue an institution, could sue his master, take them to court and argue that their rights had been violated, that they had signed a contract, and that their rights had been violated. And so there's really nothing comparable to this in Chinese history. Uh, beginning in the late 16th and then the 17th century, uh, a number of European rulers decided that they would begin acting like Chinese emperors. That is to say, trying to create modern, bureaucratic, centralized, powerful states. Uh, and so this began, you know, Louis XIV or Charles V uh, of Spain, a whole series of European monarchs uh, sought uh, to do this, but they had to do this against the backdrop of an existing European law that limited the ability of uh, European governments to violate the rights uh, of their, at least their elite citizens. They could do whatever they wanted with peasants and weak people, but certainly the way that they treated their elites was very different. You know, a Chinese emperor like the Empress Wu in the early Tang Dynasty basically killed off virtually the entire Chinese aristocracy at, at that moment. Uh, 
you know, because she was involved in a power struggle and that was her whim and so forth. You don't find very many examples of European kings being able to do that sort of thing uh, to their subjects in, uh, a comparable, uh, in a comparable uh, time period. And then, uh, of course, as we know, in the 16th, 17th centuries, you get the rise of parliamentary government, which is another check on power, which has to do with the survival of a peculiar feudal institution in Europe, the estate or the parliament, which in Britain was powerful enough to oppose the king and his centralizing mission. So the, the king was behaving like a Chinese emperor. He said, I want to be able to tax you for whatever purpose, you know, for war, for building a palace, whatever. And the parliament said, no, you cannot tax us without our consent. If we don't agree to this, uh, we are not going to pay taxes in England. There's a long, bloody civil war. They eventually, the parliamentary side wins that civil war. They cut off the head of one king, Charles II, and then they depose a second king, James II, in uh, what is known as the Glorious Revolution in 1689, uh, 1688, 1689. And this is what establishes the principle of modern parliamentary government that no king can arbitrarily tax his subjects without getting the explicit permission of parliament that over time comes to represent the whole of the English uh, population. And so the English political authority is limited both by law and by the need for democratic, um, uh, democratic accountability. And this only happens in a society in which people are willing basically to take up arms to defend themselves against the centralized power of a, of a modern state. In China, this kind of opposition to the government really never happened because once you early on establish a powerful state, the state itself can prevent social groups from arising that will challenge its power. So in China, you never had a deeply rooted blood aristocracy. You never had a commercial uh, middle class uh, of merchants that were like European merchants in, in the cities of Western uh, Europe. You never had an independent church that could make its own law and that could uh, excommunicate uh, emperors and, and, and kings. Uh, and therefore, you didn't have social organizations that could resist the power of the government. And this continues up to the present moment. The reason the Chinese government doesn't like Falun Gong and other religious organizations is they don't like things they can't control. And this is a very ancient uh, tradition in China to not permit uh, religious organizations to emerge because that is a potential obstacle to the consolidation of power uh, of the centralized state. All right, so that's the history lesson. Uh, China's development is really quite different from that of Europe and then the United States, uh, other countries that are spun off uh, from uh, European colonialism. Now, East Asia has seen the growth of a number of very strong democracies. Uh, um, in the last, uh, over the last 50 years, beginning with Japan, but now extending to Korea, uh, to Taiwan, to Indonesia, to uh, uh, a number of countries in the region. And despite this Chinese pattern of strong centralized states, I think that it is the process of economic development itself that has created the conditions under which democracy could emerge. And I believe that your country, Korea, is absolutely the best illustration of this. So Korea, uh, as we saw in the movie this morning, uh, starts out with a per capita uh, income less than the Belgian Congo or Nigeria. Uh, and within a period of 40 years becomes the 12th largest economy uh, in the whole world. Much of this growth happens under a pretty, uh, you know, a pretty hard uh, military uh, dictatorship that's willing to set the right economic policies 
uh, and produce a developmental state. But what happens as South Korea modernizes? First of all, you industrialize. So peasants begin leaving the countryside, they move to cities, they start working in factories, they start organizing trade unions, they, uh, people move to the city, you get a complex division of labor, you have universities that are necessary to uh, uh, provide the human resources for an industrial economy. Students begin to think for themselves, to mobilize, uh, to exert uh, popular pressure. In Korea, unlike in China, religion has been permitted uh, right along. And so you not only have indigenous uh, uh, traditions like Buddhism, but a very strong uh, uh, Christian movement uh, here. And all of these groups by 1987 were independent components of a developing Korean civil society and um, after the Kwangju incident and, and the various abuses by the military government, these groups got mobilized to oppose the authoritarian power uh, of the military dictatorship and by 1987 they were sufficiently cohesive uh, and strong to create a coalition that forced uh, the military to step down and Korea has been a um, you know I think a fairly successful democracy uh, ever since then and so despite this Chinese tradition of a strong central government and no civil society to oppose the state uh, I think that the process of economic development by itself uh, tends to uh, produce this kind of a result. Uh, one of the interesting questions in China's development is whether this same thing is going to happen. You know, China is still uh, a few years behind Korea in terms of its overall level uh, of development. But when China gets to that same level that Korea was at in 1987, when a majority of the country no longer live in the countryside as peasants, but they're urban industrial workers or middle class professionals, uh, is that kind of a Chinese society going to be content to live under an authoritarian uh, government, a paternalistic, you know, competent but still very authoritarian uh, government? Uh, I had a debate in Shanghai over the summer with Zhang Weiwei, who is a Chinese nationalist who wrote a best-selling book about the China model. And you know, we had a long argument uh, back and forth. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. But he asserted that China is just culturally different, that the Chinese people, all they want is economic growth. They don't care about political freedom. Uh, and what I, you know, the question that I raised is that when you have a China, you know, China right now has a middle class already that has maybe 300 million people in it. Uh, so it's still, it's, it's a significant number of people, but not a majority of the population. But if we imagine China grows another, you know, 10, 15 years so that now it's, you know, 900 million middle class Chinese, in that kind of a society with higher levels of education, with more property ownership, with more internet and you know, um, Weibo and, and you know, opportunities for people to communicate, are the Chinese uh, going to passively accept whatever government they're given or are they going to demand uh, a greater share of political participation, particularly if the current Chinese government stumbles in its management of uh, economic policy. And um, I, I believe that middle classes are no different anywhere in the world. I think that this is just a universal human characteristic. When you reach a certain level of education, you don't, you know, you simply don't accept a government just telling you what to do uh, with no uh, impact, no way to um, uh, criticize. And indeed, you know, if you, um, Think back uh, this, this year, earlier this year, the high-speed rail accident that occurred in China, which got quite a lot of attention. If you remember the sequence of events that happened after that accident, uh, people immediately started to blog uh, about it and raise questions, you know, had the railway ministry built this railroad 
too quickly, had they compromised safety, had there been bribery within the ministry, uh, the government's first reaction, or the railroad ministry's first reaction, was to bury the train <laughs> so that nobody could actually see what happened. Uh, and then they tried to shut down all of the popular criticism uh, that was arising as to their handling of this whole high-speed rail project. And I think that that's a good illustration. And, and, and furthermore, what was interesting was the government could not hold back the internet-based discussion of that accident. Uh, and so in the end, they had to unbury the two trains. They had to, you know, at least look like they were trying to hold the, the railway ministry uh, more accountable. And in the end, all of this news got out. You know, a lot of Chinese people uh, with computers, you know, knew exactly what was going on despite the government's attempts to stop that. And so I think you see the elements of a much more, uh, you know, uh, participatory and free Chinese society already evolving uh, uh, underneath that, you know, that layer of uh, political repression. All right, now, let me, well, uh, um, I guess there's a number of other things I could say about uh, democracy in, in Asia. It's different in different Asian countries. Uh, I've always thought, you know, my family comes from Japan, and the Japanese have always been much more consensus-oriented. And so you never, in Japanese, to this day, in, in Japanese democracy, you don't have a lot of adversarial politics. You had rule by one party up until about three years ago, uh, and to this day, there's not this tendency to get mad at the government and demonstrate and get out on the streets and, and complain. Uh, I don't think you can say that about Korea <laughs> because uh, I think partly as a result of the experience with authoritarianism here, you know, there's a strong and very principled uh, opposition movement and when Koreans get mad about something, they go out on the streets and they, they complain. You know, they, they're not um, consensus oriented in the way the Japanese are and so I've always thought in a certain sense that Korean democracy looks more like Western democracy than Japanese uh, democracy does um, for whatever reason. Um, all right, so let me now get back to the, uh, the impact of these political systems on innovation uh, and the development of talent uh, at the high end. And so the question that I want to ask you is, in order to develop the kind of individualism represented by Steve Jobs, do you need to have a free democratic political system or can you achieve that same degree of individualism under an authoritarian uh, regime? Now, obviously, you can achieve a great deal in terms of technological development in an authoritarian country. China itself is proof of this, or Korea under the military uh, rule. You can send people to university, you can train engineers. In fact, in um, Russia, in Stalin's Russia, the aircraft designer Tupolev, the famous aircraft designer, actually designed some of his greatest airplanes when he was sitting in a prison, as, as a prisoner of, of Stalin. And so people can work, obviously, in more technical fields, especially, uh, in very repressive uh, environments, and there's not an obvious connection between political freedom and the kind of creativity uh, that is needed to do high-end innovation in the sciences, in technology, in product design, in the arts, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, and, and particularly for countries that are trying to catch up uh, to the leaders, the most developed countries in the world, the ones that are trying to catch up have a clear path in front of them and I don't think they really need a democratic political system in order to, you know, to do that catch up work. The real question is, once you've caught up, once you are at the forefront of uh, technological development, uh, does the situation change and do you need a a freer and more open kind of political system. 
Um, and I think that here uh, there are a number of reasons for thinking this is true. Uh, Professor Wong in my session in the plenary this morning pointed out that there's still this huge dominance in Nobel Prizes of Americans, despite the fact that uh, you know, the Chinese now train you know, many times as many scientists and engineers uh, as the United States does. But there is still something about the quality uh, of the kind of training and the atmosphere in which scientists and technologists uh, and business people operate uh, that may make a difference. So let me uh, suggest uh, a number of ways in which political freedom may be um, related to uh, to this kind of, of uh, talent uh, development. Um, well, one possibility, one possibility is that true innovation is not just technological. It's not just a matter of a smart engineer or scientist, you know, doing calculations, but it is also a social and an organizational matter that you can't you could not have created Silicon Valley without innovation in the nature of the firms, without the development of a private venture capital industry, without uh, the ability of firms to go bankrupt very easily and then to restart, uh, without the ability to move intellectual property informally and so forth. And this kind of organizational innovation uh, is harder in a society that tries to control uh, its economic sector uh, much more uh, strictly. Uh, a, second, um, a second way in which authoritarian government may restrict high-end innovation is simply a matter of free speech. I mean, the, the example of the high-speed rail accident uh, is a good one. You know, it's hard to run a high-speed rail system. It's hard to develop the technology. It's hard to develop an organization that meets certain safety standards. And the thing that makes me worried about China is if they cannot even permit an open, honest discussion of the cause of an industrial accident like this. Not, it's, not a, it's not a political uh, 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 development. Uh, it's simply the cause of an industrial accident. How are they going to actually fix the problem uh, and make sure that this kind of a problem does not happen not just in the railway system, but in their dams, their bridges, uh, in the development of new products, uh, and so forth. And I think that basic inability to, you know, talk freely where, where the, you know, the political authorities extend the realm of what they consider political, even down to things like the development of a, of a rail system, uh, I think will put certain limitations on their development. The third way I think that authoritarian government can limit uh, innovation uh, is the issue uh, that Mr. Kim referred to from my book, Trust, uh, which is to say that I believe that um, collaboration, you know, I mean, we talk about Steve Jobs as an individualist and an innovator, but no innovator can get anywhere without collaborators. If you don't know how to work with people, if you don't know how to cooperate, you're not going to actually bring your product or your idea to market. And so this is this thing that I think people misunderstand about individualism. Yes, you need individuals that are willing to resist authority and to come up with new ideas, but if those people cannot work with each other, they're not gonna get anywhere. And so you need a great deal of social trust in order to do high-end innovation. And one of the impacts of strong centralized government is to reduce social trust. The government is not a neutral uh, arbiter. It does not act according to rules. It takes people's property away. Uh, officials get rich because they have good connections. Developers get a leg up on you because they've got good political uh, connections. And all of this, I think, creates an atmosphere in which people tend to retreat to reliance on friends and family, people that they, you know, the circle of trust uh, tends to be uh, relatively uh, small and weak. Um, I don't want to 
draw too much out of one single incident, but uh, there is this uh, thing that happened on YouTube where there is a photograph of a two-year-old girl in China who was hit by a couple of cars and then nobody came to her rescue and eventually she went to the hospital and died. And a lot of Chinese themselves were very shocked by this and shocked by the fact that nobody helped this girl. Now, I don't want to pick on China. In the United States, we had an incident like this in the 1960s. There was a woman named Kitty Genovese who was in the courtyard of her apartment building and someone attacked her with a knife. She was, you know, she screamed for help and a couple hundred people watched this and nobody called the police. So this is not just something that happens in China. But it did seem to me that, you know, the, the, the lack of a basic social solidarity that would allow people on the street to let this little girl lie there uh, indicates you know, in a, in a certain sense, a low level of trust between strangers. You know, within the family, there's no problem. Among your classmates in school, there's no problem. People trust each other. But there is a kind of absent, uh, generalized social trust that allows complete strangers to come to the aid uh, of one another. And I think that there's a lot of evidence that shows that authoritarian government, when it gets too strong, tends to produce uh, this, low level, uh, this low level of trust. Now, uh, and then in China, a place like China, this is also exacerbated by the fact that everybody's on the move. People have migrated from different places. They don't know each other. They don't have the kinds of social uh, links that um, they would have in a, in a country that had not seen so much uh, social change. Now, the final way that you can link authoritarian government to the development of creativity and innovation is directly related to education uh, because you tend to get authoritarian education in authoritarian political societies. And by authoritarian, I mean this pattern where you go to class under the assumption that the professor has all of the knowledge and the wisdom. The professor opens his lecture book, he reads a lecture, Nobody raises their hand, nobody asks any questions uh, because nobody wants to challenge the authority uh, of the professor. And this unfortunately is in fact the pattern uh, that exists in uh, many countries. And I would say actually it, it's not just in authoritarian countries that you get this kind of approach to classroom learning. Um, uh, although I would say that in, in, in democratic countries where this kind of thing uh, persists, it probably is still a legacy of an authoritarian political attitude that certain people have all the knowledge and the skills and the only problem that young people have is to somehow get, you know, get that knowledge from the people that have it. And I think that that is actually, uh, you know, and again, I, I know that America has got really big problems in its educational system. We've been falling behind in basic math and science and so forth. And so I'm not going to make any argument uh, you know, that holds up America as a model for education policy. But I do think that one of the things that happens in American higher education, and particularly in the more elite schools, is that they've all, you know, for a long time they've embedded a very, uh, in a sense, anti-authoritarian approach to teaching in which there's a lot of uh, questioning in, 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 in which the, you know, the students are actually encouraged to question the authority of the teacher. Obviously, you've got to do it based on knowledge, facts, you know, good arguments, but you challenging the teacher is regarded as a mark uh, of something positive rather than insolence or arrogance on the student's part uh, and, um, and so forth. Um, just relate you one story that was told to me by one of my colleagues at Stanford uh, who was teaching a mixed class of both Americans and Chinese undergraduates and they were asked to write uh, uh, a paper in the middle of the semester uh, giving their opinion about you know some uh, some issue you know about the environment or I don't know exactly what uh, what the uh, question was. And she told me that uh, in the course of trying to write these papers, finally one of the Chinese students came to her almost in tears and said, 
you know, what I don't understand is where do you get opinions? You know, where do you get opinions? Uh, because somehow in that educational system, uh, people were not taught that they are individuals that have, ought to have opinions, and that your opinion may be as good as the next person's opinion, and maybe even as good as your professor's uh, opinion. And so I think that this is, you know, one of the final ways in which the authoritarian practice in politics then gets transmitted through the educational system uh, and leads not to someone like Steve Jobs, but, you know, to people that are very good at reproducing existing knowledge, but not terribly good at uh, producing new knowledge. Now, I will just close by saying I am only presenting to you uh, a question, an open question. I don't know the answer. You know, it could well be that we'll see in 15, 20 years that the Chinese are out innovating, they're creating entire new technologies, they're doing, you know, a lot of things, and America uh, is no longer the leader. You know, all the Nobel Prizes are now going to uh, Chinese scientists. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I do think it's an interesting question for a conference dedicated to human resources and to the nurturing of talent, you know, to ask this question, to what extent does authoritarian politics uh, produce, in a sense, you know, or, or, or serve as a, as a constraint uh, on the development of genuine uh, innovation and creativity? So, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you for Professor Gilmer. It's a very valuable and insightful lectures. Yeah. We heard how the, the freedom in society and political system is related with the creativity and innovative ideas of, of our society. I think we don't need to summarize all the lectures again. It's better to save time for discussions. Now we have about 30 minutes for discuss, so you better be ready for have questions. And before you, we go to the floor for discussions, I like to give some questions to prepare for you. So, uh, first question goes like, you made a big sensation in 1992 with the book The End of History and the last man. In that book, as I remember, you said the history as epoch is ended. The democracy based on free market economy will be the end of history as epoch. After that, global financial crisis uh, has occurred and we see the continuing demonstration and the riot such as uh, like uh, occupied Wall Street. Type. So I wonder whether how you can explain this kind of activities and did you see any further development of your history as a folk? So I'd like to hear your, your explanation about that. Well, thank you for the uh, question. <clears throat> uh, so the end of history uh, is not a complicated idea. Uh, the Marxists had a concept, the same concept of the end of history. Uh, the Marxists all believed that human so societies were evolving through a series of stages and that the final stage, the end of history, would be a communist utopia. And my argument that I made in my book and in the original article was, if you looked at 20th century history up to that point, this was written in 1989, uh, it didn't look like we were going to get to communism. Uh, it looked like we were developing uh, political systems, but we were going to stop short of that utopia, and we were going to end up with liberal democracy and a market economy as the final form of you know, evolved human society. And I think that that is still the case. Um, I don't think that North Korea represents a higher form of civilization than South Korea. I don't think that uh, Cuba is a model for anyone. I don't think that Iran or Saudi Arabia are models. Now, maybe China 
uh, you know, that's the only authoritarian country out there that I think anyone would want to emulate, but I really doubt that very many societies are going to uh, be able to achieve, you know, what China has done because it's not a, it's not a model that's very easy uh, to copy. So I think that uh, we still are stuck with liberal democracy and, and a market economy. Now, that does not mean that <laughs> we are happy or that democracies work well or that our economy works well. And I think the last um, decade, and in fact, it didn't begin with the financial crisis. It really began with the Iraq War and a lot of things the United States did. Democracies can make all sorts of mistakes. And I think uh, as an American, I've been really, uh, I've become actually quite pessimistic about the nature of American democracy because it is very paralyzed, it's very ideological, uh, it is, you know, in theory we should be able to solve most of the problems that stand in front of us and yet we can't because the political system is captured by interest groups, uh, it can't make decisions, you know, and, and, and so forth. Um, in terms of the economic uh, system, uh, I think that the only important modification uh, that needs to be made after the financial crisis is that the financial sector is really, really different. Uh, you know, by and large, I think open economies, free trade and investment, long-term investment, uh, have in fact yielded tremendous benefits for those societies that have participated in that. But the financial sector is different because it, imposes externalities on the rest of society. It tends to get into this casino, you know, type of activity. And therefore, you have to regulate it. You know, you have to regulate it. Uh, and I think one of the big mistakes that was made in the United States was that we, you know, we, we had this Reagan, Ronald Reagan revolution in the 1980s where we wanted to free up markets, lower tax rates, and I think in the early days this was actually a good thing because the, the state had gotten too involved in too many things, it wasn't doing things right and, and, and so forth. But this is hardened into a rigid ideology uh, today and so the Republican Party, you know, after this financial crisis doesn't believe we need any more financial sector regulation. It's crazy. It's, it's you know, completely crazy. So I think that um, you know, every democracy uh, has got problems. One of the big problems that's, um, you know, so the problem of polarization is one that exists here in Korea. Uh, I think the, as I mentioned this morning, I think the capture of the government by powerful interest groups uh, is a disease of developed democracies. It exists in, you know, in a big way in Japan right now, and that's a lot of the cause of Japan's problems. Uh, and so I don't see an alternative higher system that's going to fix all of these problems. Certainly going to Chinese-style authoritarian government is not going to fix uh, this stuff, but it doesn't mean that we're actually happy about the, the quality of our you know, political and economic systems. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's time for the floor for discussions, and if you don't have a question, I will continue my question. It's quite a challenging job, but uh, it seems to me that uh, it's not, uh, uh, looks like a completed work yet. Why? Because uh, for, uh, to me, it's that the Asian politics, then you have to uh, think about uh, uh, the nature of diversity. So when you say there's a East Asian politics and the traditional one and the modern ones, today, today is quite different. And even the uh, Southeast Asian politics is, is totally different one. And furthermore, you're talking about Asian individualism. And then to me, it's the you uh, trying to compare Asian individualism versus collectivism. And then I think it's, it's more making sense. But even that, I think it's individualism versus collectivism and a lot of pros and cons. And uh, your thesis is something like that uh, uh, innovation is uh, more, uh, they say, evolve or develops uh, under the system of open system, right? But however, even in Asian politics, and if you consider the importance of uh, diversity and uh, some, uh, some factors or some elements are more favorable to innovations, we can observe some part of, even though it's not fully developed yet. 
And the, and the second question is the relation, nature of relationship between Asian politics and individualism. And uh, I think this uh, uh, political system is, uh, as you said, this is a full of, uh, is a combination of uh, non-political uh, factors too. And then uh, you're trying to say that, and then uh, what you have to think about the importance of culture. Asian culture is really is a, is a, is a kind of uh, emergent and a very important uh, aspects compared to, particular compared to when we're trying to look at the Western politics. And then, then uh, to what extent culture is uh, embedded, well, is a uh, feeding too. And how? I think it's, this is a very crucial question, and then I, I expect your full uh, response to that. And finally, I think it's uh, uh, the uh, Asians, as uh, particularly when you consider the importance of individual talent, yes, as, as, I, I, I should want to make it very short, and individual talents. And then I think they say, you cannot systemize, you can synthesize by saying, tackling, tackling out one or two important factors. Pick why? Because Asian people are really emergent. And then, and, and then that, their nature of talent comes out, and uh, all of a sudden, sometimes systematically, sometimes unsystematically. This nature should be considered uh, systematically. And uh, thank you, and I appreciate the further response. Okay. <clears throat> uh, well, thank you for that. I, uh, I perfectly accept the comment that actually there's a tremendous amount of diversity in Asia. Uh, and I actually, when I was speaking about Asia, I'm really speaking about the Chinese cultural, you know, where, where Chinese culture has dominated. So that's really East Asia. So it's Japan, Korea, uh, you know, obviously China, and then all of the Chinese kind of settlements in, in other parts. Southeast Asia, you know, is very different. Uh, I, if I had longer, I would spend more time actually distinguishing between different Asian countries because even with respect to something like individualism, I think that they're different from one another and in fact they're regionally different. So uh, actually in my book Trust, you know, I argued actually that there's, actually, there's a higher degree of individualism in China than there is in Japan. Uh, because, but it's the individualism of families and, and, and small groups because uh, in China there was never this, first of all, this historical village solidarity. A, a Chinese peasant village looked very different from a, you know, a Japanese one and, and there was much more conflict and social tension uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, and therefore, you know, Chinese people to this day, I think, are more ready to protest than, than Japanese. And I mentioned, you know, Korea is actually more on the Chinese side than on the Japanese side. So if I suggested that there's any, you know, I, I do think that there are generalizations you can make a, about this region and particularly about the impact of Chinese culture and historical experience on, on this part of the world. But of course, you know, that's just a very broad view and I think a more sophisticated treatment would have to recognize, you know, all of these uh, differences exist. Okay, we'll take uh, at least two questions at one time and then he, res he can have time to respond. Okay, can you give the microphone? Uh, thank you for your great lecture. Uh, I'm from the um, Songgyukwan University, Professor Saunbe. Uh, you probably had a chance to hear this kind of question. Uh, Professor Richard Florida is coming next week to Korea to speak. You know, in his book, The Rise of a Creative Class, he provides some kind of critics on the conventional idea of social trust that you suggest. And his idea is strong tie, strong bond, strong connection may hinder or limit the real innovation and development in this era of a creative economy. He suggests, you know, he, he exactly what, uh, as he did, used the case of Silicon Valley. Instead, instead of, you know, social capital, he said uh, tolerance and diversity may uh, promote uh, better uh, um, innovation. So I want to hear your response to his idea. Okay. okay. We'll take a second question. The next one? Yes. 
My name is Jun Huang. Uh, uh, I'm from uh, KAIST Center for Creative Entrepreneur. And uh, Europe and America has developed early, but Asia is still developing or developed lately. So Asia country had to follow developed country. So I think it is a, a strong connection to uh, education system. Uh, <laughs> education system is uh, <laughs> teachers, uh, power student, uh, power student <laughs> to follow a uh, textbook. Uh, how about uh, your think about this? Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, on the first question about, so the, the question is basically, to get an innovative cluster like Silicon Valley, uh, do you need more individualism or do you need more social capital? You know, people working together uh, and cooperating. Uh, obviously, I think you need a little bit of both. Uh, but really, what's the, what's the secret behind Silicon Valley? Uh, now, I think that, you know, one interesting comparison to make is between Silicon Valley and Provo, Utah. Uh, Provo, Utah, at one point, was a leading source of American software because WordPerfect and Novell and, you know, uh, Unix was out there. Uh, they had, you know, lots and lots of uh, programmers that came out of Brigham Young University. Uh, and this was a very tightly bound community because all of them were Mormons. <laughs> you know, they, they not only uh, were all white and, and looked alike, but they had the same religion. And, you know, you could say that sharing these religious roots, you know, facilitated communication and, and so forth. But you don't hear about Utah as a software center anymore because I think it was too closed a community. Uh, and, you know, it didn't have enough of the weak ties and, you know, the flexibility to bring in new ideas and, and new people. And what Silicon Valley has is a lot of diversity, but embedded in a series of norms that allow people to, you know, very different people to cooperate informally. So it's not this heavy bonding capital of a uh, social capital of a of a religious community, it's, it's more, you know, a set of informal norms that allow very different people to sit down. And I hear this all the time. I sit in a restaurant in Palo Alto and someone, you know, is cooking up some business deal, these young, you know, uh, kids who probably didn't know each other at all six months ago, but, you know, they're, they're working together uh, relatively easily. And that's because the rules are pretty well established. Um, there is a kind of common culture and background, not religious, but, but one that, you know, says it's okay to fail, it's okay to take risks, you know, uh, this sort of thing. And so it's a very complicated mixture, I think, both of the willingness to defy authority, but also this ability to cooperate. But you're right that, you know, if you don't have that basic diversity and, and, and change, it's, it's hard to... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get the, um, you know, the true innovation going. Uh, I'm not completely sure. On the second question, I'm not completely sure that I understood the question about the educational system, but uh, I would say the, f you know, the following, that textbook learning, this kind of authoritarian pattern, uh, has got its problems. The American system of questioning authority can also itself be carried to an extreme. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of American public education, uh, it has been. So in the United States uh, right now, uh, for the last generation, there's been this self-esteem movement that, you know, you can't punish a student for something because that's gonna hurt his pride or his dignity or something. And as the test scores of American uh, high school students has dropped in international rankings. The surveys show that they have ever higher degrees of self-esteem. They think more and more highly of themselves, even if they can't do basic, you know, math and, and writing and 
uh, and so forth. And so I think, again, you know, this is a question of balance that, um, you know, in an educational system, uh, there are things that require authority. There are things that you do have to just learn and work hard and memorize uh, and so forth. And so, you know, you can carry the anti-authoritarian, you know, uh, um, classroom uh, to extremes uh, as well. Or well, recent times, uh, President Obama uh, mentioned a couple of times about the Korean e educational system. So what do you think, what is referring about uh, Korean, the excellency of Korean education system? Is it, what is the difference between the? Well, look, I, I <laughs> especially in front of this audience, I don't, I don't dare, you know, say anything. Um, but one thing that's occurred to me is that, you know, because of the war and the rapid rebuilding of this country, you could actually, in a way, design an educational system from the ground up. Uh, whereas in the United States, uh, it seems to me that so many of the problems, you know, we had a great public education system uh, in the late uh, 1800s and early part of the 20th century. We were one of the first countries to actually provide universal public you know, free public education. Something like the University of California, you know, was a uh, state subsidized, you know, relatively inexpensive, extremely high quality, large university system. But over time, these institutions just degenerate. They become, you know, rigid. Uh, the public school system, I think, in the United States uh, has now become the captive of the teachers' unions, of educational bureaucracies of politicians that, you know, make all sorts of unreasonable demands of, you know, what that education system is, uh, is supposed to do. And so teachers, you know, have to follow a certain script because some administrator somewhere tells them that they have to behave that way. And I suspect that in Korea, uh, you know, maybe things will change in another 50 years, but you've probably been you know, it's a new enough system that you can actually innovate and you don't have all these deeply entrenched interests that get in the way of, uh, you know, of continuing to provide uh, high quality education. Well, we have about five more minutes to go, so if you have any further questions, I will take them. Okay. Anybody? Microphones? Please give microphones. Yes. Okay. Uh, moderator Kim and uh, speaker Fukuyama. Happy to meet you again, or see you again. Uh, thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, allow me to ask you uh, layman's question. What is the difference between the Asian individualism and European individualism, and between individualism and egoism? I, uh, briefly speaking, in your view. We can take one more question then. It's, uh, yeah, on the back. Uh, I'm Chanur Kim from UNIS. Um, I want to uh, ask you some, uh, you mentioned Russia, but uh, Russia, is, even though Russia is under authoritarian, but Russian uh, shows unbelievable uh, technology and science skills. So I want to, uh, I, I need to uh, further explain from you about that. Okay. Um, well, on the question of Asian versus Western individualism, you know, I'm not sure that there is going to be that much of a difference in the future because it seems to me that as a society, you know, as educational levels increase in a society, uh, as the level of material prosperity increases, you know, it tends to foster a certain kind of personality that, and, and then the competition from the global economy, you know, provides further incentives for, you know, developing creative talents and, 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 and so forth. And so I suspect that over time there's probably going to be, you know, a, um, uh, a convergence in, in, a, in, in, and if you look at, you know, even in China, even an authoritarian country like China, if you look at their artists and filmmakers and 
writers, you know, there's a high degree of individualism that's already expressed, you know, in, in, in the cultural realm, uh, you know, obviously not in politics, but, but in the areas where it's, uh, where it's possible. Um, I think that what I would have said, you know, in my book Trust is that uh, traditional Chinese individualism is different from Western individualism because it's an individualism of families. Uh, that the family still remain this extremely cohesive uh, social group and there's competition between families but less individualism in the family than in, in Western societies. But even that's beginning to break down and, you know, I, unfortunately family structures are, are weakening everywhere including, I guess, here in Korea. On the question of Russia, uh, you know, Russia is a classic case of being able to do rapid technological catch-up, uh, you know, under authoritarian methods. And so the Russians copied the Leica camera, they copied the U.S. Jeep, they copied, you know, a lot of different things, uh, and they managed to create, you know, pretty good tanks and military equipment and uh, so forth. But I think that, uh, and then at the very high end, they produced very good physicists, you know, so they had people like Sakharov and, you know, they developed the bomb uh, uh, and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, in the end, uh, there are very few enduring, you know, 20th century innovations that came out of Russia because, uh, and, and in fact, it's interesting, when Russians get out of Russia, <laughs> they actually do better, you know. So there's lots of Russian designers and artists and so forth, but they really need a different kind of social atmosphere uh, to really express uh, uh, those talents. Yeah. Okay. okay, it's getting too close. But if there is somebody, I cannot go without questioning this one. So please raise your hand and I will take last questions. Okay, the two persons. Okay, we, are, we have about three minutes. So if you make quick questions, we can cover both of them. It was very honored to listen to your speech. And my name is Hee Che and I'm a high school student in the Gyeonggi Academy of Foreign Languages. And I have a question to you about the social sol solidarity. And you said that the dictatorship led to the lose of the confidence and uh, I mean the trust and the confidence and the lack of social solid solidarity. But not only in China, you said that also in America there's a lack of social social solidarity, then in what specific way do you think we could develop the trust and the social solidarity in the society? Well, oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 There's no translation coming to it. Yeah. 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 Well, on the question about social solidarity, um, you know, the, the, the problem of political polarization in the United States is a question of political distrust, but it, it, it comes out of a society that still has a huge amount of social capital or, or social solidarity. So something like the Tea Party movement uh, is actually a great expression of American you know, social solidarity. You get all these people that are angry at Obama, they don't like him and they mobilize and they form a, you know, 
uh, a political movement and they elect candidates and so forth. And so there's a tremendous amount of cooperation and, and mutual support that goes into that. Uh, and so the society as a whole, I think, remains very healthy in that respect, that people can work together you know, for common uh, purposes. It's just that they don't agree on some basic fundamental points about the nature of the American government and economic policy, and so they end up yelling at each other on television. You know? But in the meantime, back in their neighborhoods, they're all, you know, they work together uh, very well. Um, to the extent I understood the, the second question, I don't think that there's a new paradigm out there. Uh, you know, as I've thought about the need for cooperation versus competition um, in innovation, in a company, in an organization, uh, it seemed to me that there's actually no optimum mixture that if you have too much cooperation you lose diversity, you don't get new ideas, you can have internal you know, uh, corruption because people just want to protect each other. Uh, on the other hand, if things are too competitive, uh, you know, the organization falls apart and, and you, you don't get basic uh, uh, ability of, uh, to, of people to work with one another. And oftentimes, organizations will cycle through periods where they're more competitive and, you know, uh, less cooperative, and then they'll go into periods when, you know, the balance shifts in the other direction. And I think there's actually no optimum point uh, there. I think that actually, as the environment changes, sometimes you need a greater degree of accountability and competition, and at other times you need, you know, a greater degree of solidarity. Japan is a good example of this. A uh, Japanese company with lifetime employment, the seniority wage system was a highly competitive, I I'm sorry, a highly cooperative uh, kind of uh, industrial organization. And it served Japan well up until the 1990s. And then at that point, I think Japanese corporations were way too ingrown and they wouldn't allow, you know, members of the Keiretsu to go bankrupt and, you know, and they needed more competition, they needed more individualism. And I think part of Japan's problem is they haven't been able to break out of that highly cooperative mode. But at a certain point in their development earlier, it was very good, it worked, it worked very well. So I don't think there's a single uh, uh, paradigm that you know, we ought to be uh, aiming for. We need a continuous adjustment uh, to existing conditions instead. Oh, thank you. Now it's time to close this session. Uh, I hope this session was helpful and or valuable to you all. Uh, let us give big hands to Professor Kao.